All right, we are live on LinkedIn and YouTube. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining this session. I think it's going to be one of my more interesting sessions. We've got 10 of us that are actually going to jump in and speak, hopefully not all at the exact same time. But this is essentially a data vendors assembling to combat poor data quality. So we're going to hear from Alistair Moore. We're going to have Jordan Morrow, Susan Walsh, Stuart Rayner, James Breers, Kevin Jackson, T. Scott Clint Daniel, Scott Taylor, the data whisperer. I kind of have to say that. Uh, George Furikin, and then uh, myself as the moderator trying to basically make sure that everything goes well in this session. So we do want to make this as interactive as possible. So please feel free to jump in with any questions or comments that you have on data quality, data governance, AI and machine learning, data literacy. We're literally going to cover all of those topics um, on a very high level. But essentially, just want to let you know that all of us actually came together a couple of months ago to design something that we're calling the iData Quality Academy. And I'm gonna introduce you to Alistair Moore here. Hello, Alistair, welcome to the Hi. show. Hello, Hi, so Alistair, do you wanna introduce yourself because you'll probably do a better job than me. Tell people who you are. I'll try. So I'm Alistair Moore, I'm the CEO of iData. I'm part of the iData Quality Academy. And for the last six, seven years, we've been dedicated to helping organizations around quality, whether it be in assurance, engineering, or data. In awesome. a nutshell. In a nutshell, great. So you had this brilliant idea, um, you know, together with your co-founder to train 2020 individuals for free on data quality. And I know we already have um, over 2,000 people signed up for the session. Where did you get this idea from and what exactly is your mission there? Well, it was more my, my co-founder's idea, but we were talking about the situation around knowledge, around data quality and the importance of it. And often we'll have conversations with organizations around the quality of data. And they would all agree, go, that's fantastic, that's great. And then you'd ask the question, what's your data quality is like? They, they wouldn't know where to start. So a good way of helping people understand the problem is by educating what the problem is. And hence mm -hmm. my idea, the Data Quality Academy came about. And then from that, because it was 2020, we thought, oh, let's help 2020 people out. And that's why it was born. Awesome. Thank you. And I know the, um, the, the iData Quality Academy is going to launch August 1st, but yeah. you're currently, um, you have the course available for pre-sale at a discount, which I'm going to put some links in the comments if people want to go ahead and, and check that out. But just letting people know that it will officially go live on August 1st, because we're still getting all the content into its best form. Um, got Manan Verma saying, yay, Data Avengers Live. So yes, we got, we got excitement in the, in the comments. Um, all right, I'm actually gonna bring in Stuart Rayner now from iData, and I think it'll be a little bit better this way. Hey, Stuart. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing great, how are you? Not too bad, not too bad at all. So you work with iData. Can you tell people a little bit about the iData tool? What do you do for the company? And basically, what's what are some of the problems that you help solve? Okay, so uh, originally uh, the, um, the the first thing that we were using iData to assist with was um, testing uh, data migrations. So we had encountered situations where we were supporting projects. Uh, to do data migration and really our only choice was to uh, do manual testing on those those migrated systems to confirm the data had been moved across as it should have been and so um, you know we had a, a discussion about how we might solve that in a more consistent and um, automated way because uh, you know, we like automation um, you know it's it's faster uh, it gives you much more consistent results and and it's a repeatable process. So we wanted to do that for uh, data migrations as well. And so that was our, our first target was database comparisons, but um, a comparison that also took into account the fact that um, the data has been transformed as part of that migration. Um, and so we have this comparison where we can confirm that the data has been moved uh, across correctly, even with the transformations, you can run it repeatedly and uh, you can get much faster feedback and more complete feedback than you possibly could 
with um, you know just manual testing. Um, and then from that, we were looking at the wider data quality picture, and um, we started looking at profiling data. So, sort of going a couple of steps earlier in that process, where um, you may be thinking about migrating, but you really need to see what the issues are with your your current data. You know, are there any um, records that that don't meet your business requirements? Uh, they might have uh, incorrect formatting, that sort of thing. Uh, so we added a, a profiling module to give you an overview of the data, tell you what was there. Um, and then obviously, once you've identified those issues, you probably want to correct them. And probably. so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you will want to correct them. Um, and, uh, and so we added um, uh, cleaning to that so you can actually correct data, bring it back into the format you would want. Um, and once that data is standardized, then you have an opportunity to look at the uh, potential duplicates in that data and you know see whether there's any records that actually represent the same real world object that you might want to link together or clean up um, to, to get your data into a great state before you move it to uh, another system. And of course, all those things apply even if you aren't thinking of migrating your data you, you know you you want to be uh you want to be in the best place for analytics and all those sorts of uh good things that you, you're going to do with that data um and so yeah that's uh that's iData and uh and where we are now yeah awesome thank you so much for that we actually have a question here from monica Kruer that i think it would be great to bring scott taylor in for so I'm actually going to add him to the stream as well. And uh, everyone in the, hi, Scott. Hi, hi everybody. How are you doing? How are you? Good to see you, Scott Taylor, the data whisperer. The Thank data you. whisperer, yes. Um, Stuart and Alistair, feel free to weigh in as well. But I feel like this was a perfect question for Scott because he actually covers the section in the um, Ag Data Quality course about selling data quality to the business. So Scott, question for Monica here. Do you have some tips and tricks to convince executives that data quality is important in more conservative companies? Oh, perfect. We did not set this up, I promise. No, first of all, Monica, thanks for sending in that question just like I wrote it. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Yes, that's my part of this whole agenda, Data Avenger Assemble here. I'm the kind of data storytelling guy to get the executives to engage, to get them interested, to get that funding all of you need for these data projects and these data programs, actually. So what I do is, and again, spoiler alert, not for too much heresy here, but I don't talk about data quality itself because quality can be very emotional, subjective kind of terminology. And we've been talking about data quality for decades and it's super important. And this whole group knows, yes, we must do it. But if you've got three minutes with your CEO, I got to tell you, don't start with, we need better data quality. You're going to sound a little bit like you're whining. You've got to start with how the data that you are going to make better enables the strategic intentions of your enterprise. That's the point. Where does the business want to go? Are they talking about customer 360? Are they talking about digital transformation? Are they talking about going to an as a service model? All you got to do is listen to that and then hear the terminology behind it around customer, vendor, partner, product, service, offering. And you know, as a data leader, you may not have the data to back it up. And so you want to show how, because your CEO is not going to talk about how we need better data quality, just not going to happen. But they're going to talk about we need digital transformation. We need a transformative customer experience. All those things need structured, high quality data to run. So listen for that. Plenty more in this course. Plenty more, and actually, everything I ever talk about is based on this. So, I'll give you a few, you. few ideas there. But sign up for the course there, Monica, and use my uh, affiliate code. I don't know what it is, but anyway, sign up no matter what. <laughs> and you can get a lot of instruction around how we try and really pitch this to the business side, which is my role in all this craziness. Yeah, I think without without that, Scott. Um you probably wouldn't be able to implement anything to do with data quality, right? If you can't convince the business that you need to improve on it. You don't have the money, then yeah. you can do it. 
So, so I'm about helping you get the money for this, all right? Just to be really straight about it. Not a lot of sort of euphemisms like let's capture value or partner or whatever. <laughs> you need funding for your data management programs and you are not going to get it if you continue the kind of messaging that's been going on for the last, I don't know, century about data quality. It's just not working. If data quality was the headline and that was the key benefit and that was the hook to the story, it would have worked by now. But it yeah. did and it doesn't. So the value's there. We understand it. We know it's real, but we're talking to ourselves a lot. So I can go on for the rest of your time, Kate, as you know, on the topic. I know, I know. I'm going to cut you off, Scott. Yeah. So anyway. I'm going to do this when it's time. Um, so a comment here from Michael saying data projects have a sort of assembly line. Uh, which implies that the parts being used must be functional or in good shape. Otherwise, it's just garbage in, garbage out, or as you say, goodness in, goodness out, right? So it's goodness a foundation. In, out. Yes, the golden rule of data, what you put into it is what you get out of it. Again, GIGO, we've been talking about that forever. If we thought it was that easy, and if everybody really understood it, then why are we still talking about it? These yeah. stories are not breaking through. We got to break through. Interesting here. Uh, Vinny just loves the way you talk, Scott. Um, just had to put that out there. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you. That's in the mail. Thank you, Vinny. Appreciate it. Um, all right. At this point, I think, uh, Stuart, I'm actually going to swap you in for James, if you don't mind, because I think that there's a question here that James can provide input in. But thank you so much for telling us all about the iData tool and the problems that you solved there. Pleasure. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thanks, so, Thanks for making it happen. Yes, I know without the tool, you can't really improve data quality, right? So James, hello, welcome. Welcome to the live show. Hi everyone, you okay? All right, so thank you so much for, for joining us. Why don't you, you know, before I get to the question that I had here, why don't you just tell people a little bit about yourself and how you work with Alistair together on this, um, on, in iData. Sure, um, I'm James Breyers, uh, CTO and co-founder of iData. Uh, I've been in, quality assurance for 20 plus years now and more recently more involved in the, the quality assurance around around data and improving the quality of data uh, hence why we're, we're here today to talk about iData and the iData Quality Academy. Yes absolutely and the question is actually about the iData Quality Academy um, so Tashi's asking here if you're able to talk a little bit more about the course itself because Tashi explored the website and couldn't find some of the information around the timeline of the course and other details. Um, so I know in terms of timeline, we are slated to go live on August 1st, but if, you know, between James and Alistair, if you guys want to talk about a bit about what the course is actually going to cover, I think that'll be really helpful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, to, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm really excited about the, the course. Um, Alistair has spent a lot of time um, pulling this together with, with all you guys and, um, I'm I'm in kind of a sat on the sidelines, just enjoying the the process, um, contributing when asked. So it's it's been it's been special to to see it all come together. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the you know the the guys who've been involved have been you know absolute experts in the field, and it is truly exciting to have them involved in this project. So you know we're going to be going through uh, various different areas around the importance of data quality, data profiling, data preparation. Uh, data transformation and assurance, um, and then you know some of the, the key key aspects around AI, machine learning, uh, and then looking at things around like security aspects or data obfuscation, and then the cost of poor, uh, poor data quality. And again, this this goes back to what Scott was saying. You know, what is what is the true cost to to a business of of having poor data quality, and that that then leads into how you get funding to to go through these kinds of exercises. Um, then we, there'll be areas we'll look at relationship between data quality, data visualization, and then of course selling selling data quality back to your business. So that's that's a quick run run through. Um, you know, it, it's really is a jam packed course, and you know, we, we're uh, really excited for, for everyone to to get involved. Yes, and absolutely. Sorry. Good. And each module takes anywhere between twenty and thirty minutes to run through. So it's about a three, three and a half hour course altogether. Yep, absolutely. Just just to add to that, you know, it's it's perfect timing as well. You know, we've all <laughs> we've all been uh, getting a little bit stir crazy. You know, staring at the same walls. 
you know, jump on jump on something that's going to, you know, ease you out of that lockdown scenario, uh, refresh what you already know, or, you know, you may even learn something completely new. Uh, it's a, a really cool, cool um, training course to, to get involved with. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to say that there have been a lot of comments and questions about where they can find a link to the course. So um, the other data vendors that are on but not in the live show yet, if you guys can just share a link in the comments, I think that would be really helpful to, to get that in there. So We're not going to worry I can pop it up and point to it and make it really interactive. <laughs> Um, but if you you know you gotta make life easier james come on you add the link and then they click it so that's it oh, okay thank you for that james let me see we got other questions here another one here i think uh similar to to the one from monica but then we got one from daniel here scott people need to know how do you get the important data quality to be known at the executive level you got to look at what your company is doing, Daniel. What kind of, what does your company do for a living? And don't say every company's a data company. I sell right? potatoes. I hate that. Potatoes. What? That what? I sell potatoes. Let's go with that. You sell potatoes. Fine. You're great. You sell potatoes. Okay. So what do you want to do? You want to make more potatoes. You want to deliver your potatoes more efficiently. You want to have a better starch like potato, yam, mashed, hashed, French fry experience, whatever those things are. There's yeah. a data piece to that. There's a data piece behind it. And if you want to make it scale, if you want to do it quickly, if you want to do it more efficiently, if you want to grow and improve, then protect your potato based relationships. There's a data piece behind that. And wherever there's data, there's data problems. And those data problems are usually quality problems and they have to be fixed and improved. So go into the executives and figuring out what's important to them. Mm -hmm. Not so much personally, but where is your company going? There are data aspects behind that. All you got to do is, is show them that link. You already know this. They don't know it, but you got to show that connection. And uh, think of it as horizontal. All right. You got a lot of different siloed kind of activities. You got all these separate systems. You've got all these different ways of doing things. And data brings a horizontal value across an organization. So just think about that kind of imagery, think about that kind of terminology, and you will mm -hmm. get in front of these executives in a much more compelling business accessible way. And so I, I put a link in, uh, in the comments here to a, one of my many articles I've posted around this very topic. And so uh, there it is right there. We got a great TD moving on here. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, uh, Kate. Um, it's my assistant. It's not me. She, she's great. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So it's, uh, but uh, just take a look at that and start thinking differently about how you explain it to people because the people you're, assume that the people you're going to explain it to have no idea what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. All right. So, and, and start there. What if you had to go, you know, at a holiday dinner? What if you're talking to your dad or your parents or your grandmother and you're trying to explain the importance of data? You wouldn't start talking about, you know, JSON and NoSQL and all this other stuff. You would talk about what it is, how it works, what the value is, how it really helps us do what we need to do. So hopefully that helps. It's not a, you know, one time for potato data. The problem is, yes, exactly. Chips versus fries, palm frites. It's all, there's a lot of data potato problems. Hey, yeah. start with that. Is it data potato or is it data potato? <laughs> Oh, oh my God! Here, moving on here. So, Andrew, data, has data, data, Andrew, oh Andrew has a question here, asking if all of this is covered in the course. And I'm actually thinking maybe it makes sense for me to just pull up uh, pull up the course agenda. I'll do that towards the in a few minutes. I'll just pull up the course agenda to show you exactly what's covered. You can also find all of that on the website where we have like the curriculum. Um, and, and exactly what will be covered in each section. So at and this so point- There's a whole section on the stuff I've been ranting about. There's selling data quality to the business leaders is kind of the, the, the last portion of it because you've got to learn all the other aspects of what data quality is before that. So you got to have the content, you got to be strong on what the foundational benefits are. Then how do you tell that story? So- yeah both there you need sizzle and you need steak on the sizzle side obviously but the rest of the team they bring it in terms of the meat and 
meat and potatoes and steak. I'll be the salad. Thanks. I'm getting hungry there. <laughs> Um, Monica said that Scott's on his best behavior. Okay, she say so, Monica. Oh, this Emma. Oh, really? <laughs> is that a challenge? <laughs> no, no, don't challenge it, please. Um, so people are getting hungry. We might have to use a different example next time. So <laughs> all the potato talk is making Andrew hungry. Um, at oh, this point, analogy to explain data. So somebody asked me the other day. I was on another event, and they said, "What you know? What do you do? What kind of analogies? Your food is great. Food." Yeah. You know, you've got food and cooking. That's the analytics part. You've got the kitchen utensils. That's the tools. It's a whole lot better. It's a, everybody's got to eat. So it's a very accessible set of poetry. If you you know, Michael that. has a good question for you. And maybe, we'll, you know, maybe they'll come out during the panel at the end. But, yeah, oh, there you go. He keeps it on there his hand. Know. The oh. IPB here. We solved our data integration problems. We found out the only way to solve our data integration. Our, we solved our data integration problems by fixing a typo. It was absolutely amazing. All it was was a typo. Instead of ETL, we found out it's ELT. It was just a typo the whole time. That's the problem with how we talk in this space, okay? You go in and you burst into your executives and you go, it's ELT. It wasn't ETL the whole time. And people are just like, what's wrong? <laughs> what's your what? So... Um, Keep it amongst <laughs> yourself. Talk to the business the way they need to hear. We'll hear about ETL and ELT when we get the other Scott on. But right now, I'm going to bring Kevin Kevin Jackson into the stream. The rest of you can hang out and stay. So, okay. hey, Kevin. Nice Hi, to have everybody. you here. Thank you. Nice to be here. Do you want to tell people a little bit about yourself and then also, you know, tell them what section of the course you are specialized in and, you know, which sections you're covering? Yeah, sure. So uh, yeah, I've uh, been involved in data and data quality, and, and all the stuff Co Scott's just reminded us all is actually boring at the uh, at the other end of things for for years on end now. Um, but hey, you know that's the contrast of the course, right? You go from people who are talking about the technical stuff like myself through to people like Scott and talking about the value of the course. Um, so yeah, and and on the course I talk a lot about data preparation. Um, and I follow up from the, the things that George is saying about profiling. I'm sure George will be on the call at some point. Um, and I talk about uh, what you need to do once you've made those discoveries with your data. What are you going to do about it? You need to prepare it for the next phase, whatever's coming downstream. Uh, mm -hmm. You need to make sure that that data is as usable as possible. Uh, you got to think about what your target for that data is. Are you looking to just migrate it? Are you looking to do some customer matching, for example? And what you need to do with it downstream defines what you're going to do in preparation. So we talk a bit about that on the course. So, Kevin, question. What happens if you skip that step? What if you don't really plan for what happens downstream? What's the worst that uh, can happen? You inherit whatever you've got in the first place. So, I mean, skipping the preparation part assumes that you're skipping the profiling part. Uh, and then we've all just talked about garbage in, garbage out, right? Yeah. So you're going to get you're going to get what you get. It's not going to be ready for what you're doing, and you're just going to try shove it in. Uh, and I have I seen, have seen unfortunately, on the odd time I haven't shouted loud enough, um, projects fall over, migrations fall over. They they don't know what to do. They can't load the data in. They've not handled the exceptions properly, mm -hmm. and it fails. And it's quite <laughs> it is as simple as that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and the other side of things there is if you're trying to not going to pre prepare your data and you're doing something like a customer matching process, mm -hmm. you're going to do one of two things. Neither is desirable. You're either not going to match your customers or oh. you're going to, you've not prepared them. You start getting false matches. Uh, I don't want to name any, uh, any companies, but we have seen them over the last couple of years do that kind of thing and come out into the news. And I don't want to be in the news. I don't know about you. Yeah. Well, if it's in good light, it depends, right? If you're talking about double lottery winner, then okay, that's fine. But other than that, <laughs> you mean a kitchen from a from a fire? I mean, you can be in the news for different things. Just the lottery, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got a question here. Let's see, from Billy. So Billy's asking, what's your take on the implications for poor data quality to an analyst's productivity towards solving business problems? So who wants to take that? Raise your hand. I'm kidding. Just answer. Yeah, I'll start with that. 
I mean, again, you know, we've, we've just talked about some of that stuff, um, you know, assuming your, your analyst means, you know, a, a business analyst or a data analyst, but I know one of the statistics and, you know, was it 73% of statistics are made up on the spot, but um, I saw something quite a large percentage of data scientists, for example, spend way more time preparing their data than they do actually using it. And they're not productive. Just doing, you know, if you spend some time up front, that's where it should be spent, making sure that your data is of a sufficient quality and handled correctly. If it's not correct in the first place, you're going to have more success up front. You're going to have more time to do the things you need to do. Let people do their jobs. My job is data quality and fixing that kind of thing. Their job's data science. I don't understand it. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that the percentage is about 80% uh, of their time cleaning, right? Yeah, yeah somewhere they're... between like 60 and 99.9%. .9%. I've been hearing about this forever, right? They're doing data munging, data wrangling, all these cute terms that mask the real fundamental problem at the core, which is the data they're getting sucks. So not all of it is going to be managed in a centralized or a kind of formalized data management process. I understand that, but a lot of things, duplicates that Kevin was just talking about, that's some data management should be taking care of that. The data quality team should be taking care of that. They should be feeding that. Yeah. So my little answer, Billy, to your question is, there's two things people want to do with data. They want to derive, uh, they want to derive meaning out of data. That's what analysts do. But before that, they have to determine the truth. Guess which side I'm on? I'm on the truth side here. I don't have a I don't have a hat that says meaning. I'm a data guy. So data is about determining the truth. And let's stay business oriented here. Some people pick at that and go, there is no common truth. You can't, you know what? You can get a standardized customer hierarchy. You can get a consistent product taxonomy. You can unduplicate the crap you've got in your database if you spend the time on it. Those things are mission critical. They have to get done instead of sitting around debating the philosophical nature of there is no truth in this organization. It's about business. It's not, not about your personal spiritual journey here. It's yeah. just about business. So determine the truth first, then you can derive meaning out of that analytical process, whatever it is. And it's not chicken or egg here. It is egg and omelet. You got to do the truth first before you derive meaning. So end rant. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you for that. Mr. Truth, um, we got a question here from Yoav. Uh, how do you deal with old versus new systems that still require data reconciliation and data comparison on an ongoing basis, sometimes on a real-time basis? Uh, that's an interesting question. I think it, uh, there's a lot of nuances in it, surely. Um, but, you know, if you've got old systems and new systems, it's something I've dealt with before where you've got by literally talking to somebody who's who's got the mainframes on one side of things and, and running data in you know really old formats and going right through to the most modern um, actuarial tools that you've got going on there. You do need to do, <laughs> funnily enough, I was talking about this earlier today, you do need to do some manual comparisons quite often in those situations or at least semi-manual, this is quite a technical question, um, where whereby you need to pick your data, count it, maybe do some other things with it to reconcile what data is coming across, assuming that's what we're talking about with the reconciliation um, mm -hmm. and your comparison. And quite often what you might have to do is extract the data into a, into a separate environment. Um, <laughs> I wonder if we could think of a tool where we might be able to take this data out and maybe do some reconciliation against it. Any, anyone, anyone know of any tools? That we're talking um, about here? Might, not one, might not one or two. So. <laughs> yeah. I, I did. Did. Yeah, just to throw one in the mix. Um, so yeah, so, so quite often you might need to do that. You might need to take the data out of those systems to make sure that you can compare apples with apples. Um, otherwise it gets pretty tricky trying to compare in an old mainframe system with something in a brand new, you know, whatever, Oracle-y, Microsoft-y, SAP-y, yeah. IBM-y, other tools are available solution. Hmm. All right, thank you. Um, sorry, my was it was, uh, it was breaking up a little bit. I, I, are you guys hearing each other fine or no? Yes. Oh, okay, cool. Might have been just me then. Um, I do have another question here that I think would be good to bring Susan Walsh in for. So I'm going to bring in Susan. Hi, Susan. Hi, Susan. 
Yay. I'll let you introduce yourself first, and then I'll bring the question in. So, Susan, I know you're the classification guru, but uh, just do a little intro and tell people what they're going to hear from in your section of the course. Hey, um, hi, everyone. So, yeah, I am Susan Walsh, the classification guru. I'm a fixer of dirty data, um, specializing in spent data classification and taxonomy customization. I have worked in my time a lot with AI and machine learning to try and conquer this uh, problem. So in my section, I will be talking around the importance of having accurate data before you even start to code and write scripts and use fancy mathematical formulas for your AI and machine learning. None of that will work. You could have the best formula in the world. It will not work if your data that you're learning from is not accurate and true. Um, and I did see actually a question earlier about bias as well. So that's the question I had set up for you, Susan. Ah! There you go. Look at that. Yeah. So regarding data quality impact in machine learning, is fixing the bias in data really possible? And will fixing data bias introduce bias in another way? So I was looking for opinions. Let's hear yours. Okay, you can't fix bias. It's that's fact. That's a historical fact. So we've learned from data in the past that was fact. So it's bias and it's wrong, but it's still true, accurate data. So what we need to do is take more recent data and learn from that and make sure that's accurate. But but by fixing something, you're you're making the data incorrect. You're make misleading potentially. Um, I would be very wary about correcting any bias. Personally, I don't know why. Any other thoughts on that from, from the rest of you guys? That covers most of it for me. Okay. Um, Bruno had something to add here saying that there is another kind of bias you should be more concerned, like the economic bias, economics bias. I'd like to know more about, for him to expand on that, what he means more. Because some of the data that you deal with in AI and machine learning is not financially based, so mm -hmm. so economics doesn't always play a part. So it would be interesting to to know or have an example of what he means by that. Yeah. Um, somebody else it doesn't say the name here for for some reason, but uh, somebody said don't start with a story and make the data fit. Yeah, it's, it's a, uh, Mark Price, I think it is. But yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, I didn't pull in through Streamyard for some reason, but that was interesting. So don't, I, I've actually had situations where I would um, be told what they're expecting to hear from the data, right? And by they, I mean the client. Yeah. And you provide yeah. what the data is actually saying. They're like, no, 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 you're going to have to do this again. Like, no, your numbers are wrong. no, no, these are the numbers you gave me. Everything's right. Yeah. It's just maybe in a different place from where you thought it was. Yeah. And isn't it yeah. worrying that we've all just nodded along to that? We've all seen that. Isn't that yeah. worrying? <laughs> Um, and then we got a comment here from Russell that if there was no bias, we would all have the same opinion. It is discriminatory and unconscious bias that we need to correct. Okay, true. So, yeah, absolutely. So, okay, thank you for that. At this point, I'm actually going to bring in, sorry, I'm going to bring in George. So George Farrakhan, I'm going to have to remove. Sorry, Kevin. Like it, Just like my survivor. Kevin. <laughs> Who's, who are you going to vote off the island here? No, he's he's out. out. Okay, just a quick one. George. Hello, hey, everyone. Oh, sorry. Sorry, just a quick one. A comment by Monica Krua saying one of my favorite colleagues says, a fool with a tool is still a fool. She's, she's absolutely yeah. right to comment, but I think it's about making sure a tool is as user friendly as possible and then also educating the fool to not be a fool with that tool. So again, this is what this course is all about. It's, it's an education from a rounded perspective. And if they want to get training on tools, then again, they should apply that. They should get knowledge and learn how to use a tool properly and ensure they are not a tool with a tool. Yeah, I mean, to, to, add, to add to that as well, it's some, something that from a consultancy perspective, um, obviously we, we create a tool, uh, but from a consultancy perspective, it's not just about installing a tool and just running some stuff. There's lots of things that have to happen to support that and set up an ecosystem to make sure that that tool is is then supporting the strategy to to get you where you need to go. So yeah, I mean it. 
it's it's a valid comment to to be honest with you. you know, a lot of people think that they can install a solution and and away they go. Well, there's a lot of planning and prep that needs to go on before that. But you need to know your own data as well. So you can put the, your data into that tool, but if you don't know what you're looking for when it comes out, when it's been processed, then yep. and it's not going to be much use. So it, yep. it's about being familiar with your own data and checking it on a regular basis as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so George Ferrican, welcome to the show. Sorry you had a an interesting intro for you, but why don't you take a minute, tell people who you are, what you do, and uh, what are the sections that you're covering in the iData Quality course? Yes, well, I'm your friendly data guy. <laughs> I'm the founder of Lightroom Data and its YouTube channel. That's by day and by night. Ooh, I've just revealed my secret identity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's George. I didn't recognize you. Oh, I can. <laughs> how, how could nobody really figure out the Clark Kent situation, right? <laughs> I know. So by night, I'm a data avenger. <laughs> or by day, I don't know. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> During your lunch breaks, you're the data avenger. <laughs> Just... Exactly, exactly. Yes, yeah, so I cover two sections actually in the curse. Uh, the first one is on the cost of poor data quality. Because I think we need to be aware, we need to support Scott's message as well on how do we present this to the management and sometimes we need to bring that cost part of it as well, right? So I go over some real life stories outlining how high the cost is that poor data quality brings to the organization. IBM did a survey and analysis a while ago and they were mentioning that at the US level alone, so just one country, the cost of poor data quality is $3.1 trillion. And if you can't really grasp how much money that is, if we were to spend one million dollars a day we would still have money in our pockets after nine thousand years oh wow so, and that's 3.1 trillion dollars that are being lost due to poor data quality a year and that's in the u.s or is that a global figure in the u.s so imagine globally how much more mm -hmm. the loss is and is is this potential is this loss due to mistakes and errors or is this potential revenue that's um yeah exactly that. it's really a combination it's definitely those lost opportunities as well which can be quite high but it's mm -hmm. also because of operational inefficiencies and really mistakes and management decisions which are poor because they are based on that poor data quality so and then the second section and the second one is on data profiling and i cover why it's important what it is and go over three really key data profiling techniques, and that's uh, column profiling, table profiling, and cross-table profiling. Amazing. Um, sorry, I was laughing because Russell said that this is like a game show and who's going to drop next. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do have a few more people I'm going to bring in. So yes, yeah, somebody is going to have to uh, drop. But just wanted to remind those who've tuned in live that you can um, ask the data ventures any questions you have on data quality, data governance, data soon, uh, data literacy. Oh, Scott Taylor is waiting for it. Bring it on. <laughs> data management, classification, uh, data profiling. So we're here to answer any questions and as well as um, discuss the iData quality course. Let's see. Donna. Donna says, Russell Willis, I like having everyone in one place rather than separate calls. It's fun waiting to see who drops next. I wish I could have more people in one view. Then we'd have all 10 of us on. but. Unfortunately, we can only handle six at a time uh, before uh, StreamYard just explodes or something. I don't know. But George, thank you for that. Uh, Charlie Crane says this is an unbelievable statistic. So it is. That, that is true. Stories in the course. Yes, absolutely. What um, a teaser. Hmm? Oh, just saying, what a teaser. Oh, that's a teaser. Yes, exactly. And the course also has quiz questions along the way. So try to uh, make sure that you capture what you learn in that course. And uh, at the end, you also get a certificate. Just wanted to let people know. Um, at this point, so we are going to have to have somebody drop any meeting, any mo. James, you're going out the. Sorry, you're in my bottom right corner. That's for us. <laughs> So, James, we'll see you soon for Q&A, and I'm going to go ahead and bring in 
Where is Mr. T. Scott Clendaniel? Hello. Hi. How are you? Hello. How are you? Thank you. Very well. How are you? Fantabulous. I'm a data venture. How much better could I possibly be? You are the data venture. I mean, this is, this is great. So uh, why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself? Sure. I work for Leg Mason and soon to be Franklin Templeton as lead data scientist. So I'm responsible for helping folks identify patterns in data and to reduce uncertainty when people go to make decisions. And the piece that I worked on with this incredible group of folks was the ETL chapter of the course, which has to do with extracting, transforming, and loading data and the processes to try and avoid mistakes and the importance of having a virtual undo button. Okay, and uh, we were chatting a little bit about this earlier, but ETL versus ELT, as Scott mentioned with a typo, really? is there a preference, is there a right way to do things? BLT tends to be more popular than BLT. either of those. Oh, what is that, baby lettuce tomato? Oh, or no, okay. but I'm vegetarian, so I kind of luck out on that one. But um, ETL, um, or my least favorite term, is data ingestion, which seems to be all the rage, especially with the cloud-based vendors. And while I understand the concept, um, if you thought ETL was bad, I don't know how ingestion sounds more palatable. Um, we've got, thank you for that. We've got a uh, question here from Yoav, whoever wants to take this one. What tools and processes can run and point to where money is lost due to lack of data quality? Are there specific process mining and classification methods in use? There's You're no looking for like a billion nickels and dimes. That's the problem. Yeah. Okay. And it's really mm -hmm. not about, it's, it's, it's a little bit about saving money, about saving pennies, about, you know, these, this process getting half a second better across a whole bunch of people, but focus on what, the opportunity costs of what your business cannot do without high quality, well-governed structured data to make can I share? scale. That's my uh, To the data whisperer, can I take an example of a story? Sure. There it was actually a major consulting firm who worked in the data science space and they were working with an oil producer. And the oil producer decided that what they really wanted to do was to come up with a predictive model that came up with better places to drill. So where are we going to find the next gusher? So they came in and they did all the reviews and they found uh, that they needed to conduct a large number of interviews. One of those interviews came back and said, uh, you know, we noticed that you guys were down for 45 days in a row. So before we figure out the next place to drill, what happened there? I said, oh, yeah, we were missing a part. You're missing a part and you were shut down for 45 days. Well, yeah, we're in the middle of the ocean. That's a custom part and really a big problem. Well, he found out that they had all kinds of signal data available to them. So one of the problems wasn't that the data was wrong. It was that no one was even using it. So what they did is they decided that if a single part can cause them to go down for 45 days, that there was probably a much bigger opportunity with data quality in terms of using the data they had to be able to predict the failure level and when a part was gonna break. And if a memory serves, they ended up saving that oil company $200 million a year. Wow. So when you're trying to figure out where your opportunities are for data, in addition to finding all those nickels, which is clearly the case for m most industries, there are cases where there's a large supply of data that is currently laying fallow that people aren't taking advantage of that can produce ridiculous gains. And to Scott's point, if you run around shouting data quality, data quality, data quality, no one's much going to pay much attention to you. If, however, you're able to connect it to the p &L, you're in much better shape. Better shape. Mm -hmm. I know, um, yeah, go ahead. In, in my world, within procurement data, that you know, sometimes they get it's taken them a month to get a report, whereas I can do something for them within a matter of days. So it's finding tangible um, benefits that, that can be quite challenging. You know, I often say it's you know, I'm I'm preventing you from making costly decisions. You can't you can't quantify that, but but you know it happens. 
Um, so it's just it's talking to uh, budget holders in their language as well. Not as Scott would say, not not tech talk, but but corporate, you know, bottom line kind of talk. That's what gets them going. Yeah. Ask your compliance department what happens if you turn in incorrect numbers and you get audited and they get shut down by the federal government of whatever country you're in. Uh, you might want to start from there because that's usually a good place. If you want to put fear into the organization and you can't do it with revenue or nickels, compliance is the magic word. That you, you're bringing up, I, I kind of boil it down to these three buckets where I see all business focused on growing improving and protecting. And so those That's three great. things every business wants to do, they want to do that and they want to do that to bring value to their relationships. Every business has got relationships, right? Customer, vendor, partner, prospect, whichever side of it is you got relationships and mm -hmm. they do that through their brands, which is what they make or what they deliver or the service they provide. So you find you determine the truth and you derive meaning out of data to grow, improve and protect your business to then d provide value to your relationships through your brands. I can say that, you know, can reconfigure that a whole bunch of ways. But that is for me, I'm trying to find a business that doesn't do that at some level. So the tip out there to all those folks who are thinking about how do I get to the executives? That's what your business is. I don't even know you. I don't know your business, but I know you're trying to grow, improve, and protect it. I know you got relationships. I know you got brands. You're trying to bring value. Go nuts on that. But think structurally that way yeah. to tell your data story. And you know, like, you'll know you'll get into the right kinds of conversations. Yes. And like T. Scott mentioned, organizations also want to avoid fines and jail time too. Yeah. Yes. That's that protect, nice. right? So mitigate risk. So under protect, compliance, mitigate risk, privacy, security. Those are all protection kinds of things. Yeah. Also, from revenue. the days, yeah, go ahead. From the days where I tried to sell these projects, if you're trying to get a toehold in an organization to start, if you focus on risk or potential loss, for whatever reason, that seems to go much farther in the process than saying, oh, I think there's a potential new revenue stream. The potential new revenue stream or higher revenue gets them excited initially. Yeah. And then it gets stalled and falls apart in the procurement process. However, if you come to them and say, I can say 15% on your top expense line item, it is much easier to get buy-in from that and expand from there has been my experience. And, and, and the beauty of the space we're in and the absolute miracle of having better quality data is that you can do all three of those things at once. Absolutely. At a file. So you start with, look, the risk in our customer interaction is really high. We got to stay in compliance. So we need a better structured, unduplicated customer master. Now, you know what that'll also do? That'll make our customer oriented processes more efficient. That's improved. And then you know what else that'll do? It'll help us with cross sell, upsell. That's, that's, um, grow. And the data is the same data. There's no other department out there that can make a claim like that for the work that they do. So if you're a data leader out there or an aspiring data leader or a data vendor yourself, you've got, you're in a space that can do all kinds of stuff for your business that really there isn't another department can do that spectrum of benefits for any kind of enterprise. Absolutely. Well, and that's with, the the, truth. That's with the push for artificial intelligence, which is lovely. I mean, that's the field that I work in. That's fantastic. But if the data is incorrect, it's not going to help you. 85% of projects in the data science predictive analytics projects, according to Gartner, never reach production. And part of that is because they haven't figured out how they're going to do their data migration correctly in terms of ongoingly, how are you going to get the data in and how are you coming up with score for that model? How are you going to put it into practice? So it's great on the one hand that people say that the average ROI from an analytics project is 1200%. Well, that's really impressive. But if 85% of those projects are failing because your data quality is messed up, you really need to address that first to be able to get to those high ROI numbers. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we have a question here from Mahesh that I think maybe Alistair, you can take this one. It's, uh, Mahesh is asking, I wanted to know how your course will help with regards to healthcare and data projects. So I know 
healthcare is not immune to the issues that come with poor data quality. Healthcare, especially in the near industry, are very, very worried about compliance, as both Scott, well, both Scott the Whisperer and T Scott mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah the Scotties, the Scotties. Uh, the course will go through why data profiling, security of data is so important to projects and programs. And in the healthcare, you're dealing with a lot of private and personal data. And it's how you can share that data through obfuscation, which is a security method. So there's various areas of the course that will support you with that. I think the healthcare, especially with certain recent times, COVID, that's happened, has really highlighted the need for proper data quality. And you can't speak more than that. Political, which I won't do. Well, thank you for that. The, the time has come to drop somebody else because we do have another speaker. So, um, George Ferrican, thank you for your time. Thanks for and, having uh, me, guys. I'm going to thank T Scott as well. And I'm going to bring in Jordan Morrow from Click. He is the Very king good. of data literacy, but I'll let him introduce himself. Hey, Jordan, welcome to the show. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. No, uh, no. Yes. No, okay, I'll, I'll just start saying some really off-color things and be good, <laughs> no. Uh, Jordan Morrow, Global Head of Data Literacy for Click and Chief Nerd Officer is my nickname. Happy to be here. All right, well, if you can tell people what uh, section of the course are you covering, what can they expect to hear there? Just a well, little teaser. If you think about data quality, you can you can teach people all you want about data literacy, get them as empowered as you want with skills to do data and analytics. If the data is crap, the data is crap and it can't be used. So a lot of what I cover is is this combination of quality with literacy. How does it impact each other? How does it benefit an organization to make sure those things are tied together? And I can tell you right now, there's a flip side to it. that data literacy also empowers an understanding of why data quality matters. And I think people lose sight of that. Data literacy, I think we think, oh, it means analytics, we're gonna be able to do this and that. Yes, that's true. But at the same time, we also have to understand that if we want data quality to matter, people just need to understand data in general. And that's where data literacy also comes into play. And uh, maybe just briefly define what is data literacy to those who might not yeah. have heard of this term. Yeah, uh, just straight definition. Think of it as your comfort level or confidence level with data, the ability to read, work with, analyze, and communicate with data. I love how you have that just memorized. Yeah, I would hope after four years now, I would hope so. <laughs> Which is a testament and a great example to all you data folks out there. You better have your elevator pitch ready. So if you heard Susan's intro, perfect, yeah. right? You said it a million times. I'm pretty good at it too. Jordan's good at it too. So when you bump into an executive and they say, what's the point of your data quality initiative? It better not be the first time you say it aloud. Go home, practice in the mirror, practice in yeah. front of people who think you might be in you know, might be embarrassed, better to do it a hundred times and then do it once perfectly when you need to. So that's a technique tip for all of you folks out there. Great tip. Good yeah. tip. Absolutely. Um, Susan, I think this might be a question for you from Michelle here. Um, your thoughts on using AI machine learning in surveillance security and its impact when it goes wrong. So for example, a wrongful um, arrest uh, because wrong predictive analysis tool that is biased. No, we touched on bias a little bit earlier. Yeah. Um, so is it, are we talking facial recognition or are we talking some kind of other predictive? Because I guess there's a huge difference. I mean, either way, it, it resorts right back to the very start. Whoever is tagging, testing the system, you have to make sure that the data is right mm -hmm. before you start moving it into the wider public, you know, especially with something like that, you can't take any chances. Yeah. yeah and you have to have people who know, who know the data, you know, I think very often the quality is just thrown onto someone else's job. It's not really treated as a skill within itself. Um, however, you know, it is a skill within itself and it should be treated as such. And, and maybe then we can, get organizations to also start to take it a bit more seriously if it's recognized as a as a job or a role within an organization absolutely thank you um, another question oh you have something to add sorry go ahead yeah i just think it's, it's a really good point to pick up on it in general for all these things is that um yes you need the data but it's data is part of people processes and technology right 
So, you know, in, in the specific example we just had, you, you wouldn't assume someone would be uh, arrested just because of uh, some, some artificial intelligence, right? There's a process that it feeds, but I can bet you it's going to speed those processes up. So, again, you know, we, we looked at it earlier and, and it's the same whether it is um, uh, digital surveillance or whether you're looking at something a lot more, I don't know, vanilla, if you like, data migrations and, and customer matching and things. Your data quality's got to be right, but you're still going to need some human intervention at points. So let's not forget that it all sits hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we had another call question here from Afalabi. How does data quality relate to digitalization? Did you mean making okay, stuff so digital? Is that what you mean? You know, digital means data. Data needs data management. Next question. No, not to be too uh, quick yeah. on that. It's kind of everything. Well, anything you put into the digital world has to be accurate. Yeah. You know, yeah. you need to do that step before you digitize anything. You know, even if you're using RPA, you know, check that it's right. Again, back to use use humans hand in hand. Well, yeah. and, and and one of the things that I would add to that is don't don't just embrace digitalization because it's cool. Right when I was remodeling my house, the we were buying a dishwasher, and the guy was trying to sell me a more expensive one that connected to the internet. He was talking to the wrong guy. I said, "I don't care. I, I can care less." Right. So, what what outcome yeah. is your digitalization trying to accomplish? Make sure you know that. Make sure yeah. you know. Don't just yeah. pull data for data's sake. Then it's going to be costly. Pull data with an outcome on purpose, and make sure the data has quality. Because if it doesn't, then you might be making decisions that are way out there. But then similarly, there's, a, there's an, an everyday example with all that, really. Uh, when I've been talking to marketing teams, for example, they want to know about the quality of the contact data they hold to allow them to go digital. They're less and less interested in where you physically live. They don't want your postal address. They want to know that, that you've got an app and that you've got an email address and that you're contactable by a, a mobile phone, a cell phone, wherever you are in the world. Um, know those things so on a real simple level okay he's, he's, he's clarified by digital strategy digital yeah strategy. Okay, so on a simple yeah. level okay. there every uh, digital you need strategy to make sure yeah. sorry go ahead yeah no that's fine <laughs> um, i understand where you're, where, you're, where you're coming from scott but like i said as, as a as a specific example of what i was doing the marketing guys wanted to go more digital they don't want to post people because it costs them money and they don't know it's a lot it's a lot harder to know that somebody still lives at that postal address whereas everyone's walking around with the mobile phones right the, the, the cell phones so they want to know that they can get in contact with you via the app via your text message via an email and then of course they want to be able to get the feedback from that the feedback loop from that to tell them that somebody's still engaged and and that could go right from marketing right to being secure about your your banking app for example one that i worked on made sure that text messages were being sent to that person and being received from that person in a six month period to guarantee that that person's mobile phone is still theirs mm -hmm. guaranteed that they might have yeah. passed it on to someone of their own fault <laughs> well other than that they've got a feedback loop right so the, the very basic data of looking at your line by line, how have we got a valid email address? Is it is it usable? For example, that's another great piece just to just to be able to contact them. As for the strategy, I think Scott is absolutely itching to go for it here. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll you can't have a there. digital strategy that succeeds unless you have data quality, high data quality. It's just that it's really literally that direct. If you need to quote me to your leaders, go ahead. I'll give it to you any way you want to. But every digital strategy every transformative customer experience, every as a service offering, the implementation of every single type of enterprise software platform is inextricably linked to the value and the quality of the output from your data management program. It is, it, there's no other way to do it. Now you need other things, people, process, technology, but if you don't have the data part right, the rest of that stuff will simply not work. Yeah. I'm sure it's gravity, man. Okay, really, it's Newtonian <laughs> physics here. It is like, period. It's the only way it works. So, new question here. Thank you for that, Scott. Mm -hmm. um, Russell Willis, a question for Jordan, uh, data literacy. Would you also include the ability to optimally adjust the, 
detail level with which you discuss visualized data to suit the specific audience? I guess this goes to your definition of um, what data literacy includes. Yeah, if you look at the last uh, characteristic, there are four characteristics, and the last characteristic is communicating with data. The mm -hmm. ability to adjust your communication, whether you're speaking to a group of executives, they're going to need it brief. They're going to want the points. They don't need a wordy explanation. If you're explaining it to a data scientist, they're technical. They may understand it better. If you're explaining it to an analyst, again, it varies. Um, so absolutely, you, you better, as we develop better communication skills within data, we better be able to communicate differently with different audiences. But this does also tie back to data fluency and the organization as a whole should have kind of this baseline level of data fluency that enables people to have these conversations in general. Yes. Jordan, you. Jordan, you cover off that quite well on the podcast you've been doing of late. I think it's your episode mm -hmm. four. I think you cover off how you communicate with others within the business. Yep, absolutely. And I, the way, I mean, there are certain things to get. There's a book out there I highly recommend for anybody from Nancy Duarte called D Data Story. Um, Brent Dykes is another one that I would follow out there. Miko Yuk, a very popular name. They give great tips and tricks on how to communicate more effectively. So dive into them for sure. Um, we've had a question here from Ravi a couple of times, so I'll just I'll just put it up. And maybe you guys can go back and answer him. But he's asking if anyone here is interested in writing a book, um, a data book. Done. <laughs> I was there, just wrote one this morning, so obviously. <laughs> Um, I know we have several more comments and questions, and we are at time, so I want to be respectful that, you know, respectful of people who I've told is this is going to be a session for an hour. I don't want to go over. So just I just wanted go to. Over. I, don't worry. We're going to. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have to I'll drop? I got more. I got, I got more puppets. I'm good. I'm good here. We got. We got plenty to do. So don't don't leave on account of me, Kate. Okay, really. So. So. I, I yeah. I know, Scott. I could just leave completely, and you'll just keep going. Yeah, and just leave, leave it on. You did that once, didn't you? <laughs> I did that. Been live with you, and you said, "Oh, I have to go get a drink." And you I left. I have to my second you coffee for the camera the on, and yeah, yeah. I, I left got really seven new followers it. just from that. Yes, that was great. So, whatever. Just wanted to remind people that you know these are the data Avengers. We do have a course coming out August first, where probably ninety-five percent of the way there. Just a few final touches before we can officially launch. And in the course, you know, we'll cover things from importance of data quality, the cost of poor data quality. We'll talk about um, some a few things we didn't mention here, but I'm covering the data visualization as it relates to data quality, as well as the need for uh, proper data obfuscation as it relates to GDPR and CCPA and the, the privacy regulations. And then of course, uh, AI machine learning, data literacy, AI um, transformation and assurance, ETL, and what else? Selling data quality to the business. Selling, I'm sure it, is selling it in, babies. Doesn't <laughs> matter. Stuff doesn't matter if you don't get the funding. Hate to break it to you. It's the hard facts of business. Yes. So um, let me just take, I guess, the last question here from Vinay. How to know if my data has some kind of error, such as transformation error or database error or any kind of error in data processing stage? And how do I remove that? I, I won't take that question. I, just, <laughs> no, no, I will not take that question. I'm, you need to go and get a drink. No answer to that question. <laughs> I will. Um, I will bring in James. So, ooh, we're back to having to drop somebody. Let's see. I'll bring in James. Drop me. All right, Susan. Good to have you. We'll see you soon. Hi, <laughs> Susan. Um, all right, uh, Mr. Peters. So we've got a question here. Hoping you can address um, from sure. the name. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, it's it's something that, that we, well, one of the main reasons why we, we brought our data to the table, to be honest with you, was to, to help with, with identifying these kind of issues. Um, and, and it goes back to other comments that I, I made earlier and other people have made exactly the same. You know, we, we have a tool that can provide you with the, the mechanism to, to perform the transformation assurance, but before you even get there, you, you, have, to, you have to start by understanding what the transformation rules are there to be um supposed to be doing and then you feed that into an assurance process and you use a tool like our data to actually automate that process so you can you can check all of these kind of transformation um rules against 100 percent of your data as opposed to just doing um you know 
historically uh, like a sampling process. Yeah, and I think um, I think this is the kind of stuff that is covered in some of the earlier parts of the course that uh, that George has um, been presenting and myself, where you know you you can use these tools to do that kind of thing. Kind of thing. Uh, and the, but the final question there is how to remove that, uh, and I guess part of that is, uh, do you want to remove it? And sometimes that the, the answer might well be yes. You know, if you've got a bunch of email addresses that say uh, non at no email dot com, it's probably better to remove them from your data than not. Otherwise, that's a really long question as to how to correct it all. Depends if you need to use some reference data, if you need to just use some lookups, if it's just a case of standardizing, if it's a case of doing some standardization to make your data integration better. Hey, the tool can do that kind of thing for you. And, and I, think, I think also, just to add to that, is that you know, it's not just a technical um, question to answer. I think you know, in those situations, you need to bring in you know business and SMEs to actually you know validate um, yeah. that, that you are making the right decisions, and yeah, you know, it's that, not that, just that, that guy that, yeah. making that call. I was just saying, you know, do you want to delete, delete it or not? Well, yeah. me, I do that kind of thing as an analyst. It's not my decision. I present that. And people like say so I present that, and someone decides if they want me to get rid of it or not. Definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm actually going to bring in Stuart uh, Rayner back. And Jordan, thank you for your time. This is this is the part where we talk about that. Jordan, grab Stuart's back in. Uh, so, Stuart, I wanted to hear your thoughts on this question before we wrap up. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, uh, what Renee's uh, a part of Finney's question is how do we know that uh, you've got some issues? And I think you know that the very first step in, in any of these uh you know cleaning operations is to is to profile your data understand what you've actually got there uh before you take any actions on it so you've yeah that, that's the first step understand the data and uh and then you can decide what sort of actions to take yeah why would you guess you know if you can if you can look at it find out the actual things and actually see each row and see all the problems you wouldn't want to guess right yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, sorry, my thing froze again, but I think we're we're all back. Um, I do want to wrap up, so I'm just gonna give everybody a one liner. Just tell people where they can find out more about you, or where do you want them to reach out to continue the conversation? And then once you say that, I'll drop you and bring in the other people, just so they can get their last feel and you know thank you for everybody who joined obviously but maybe Stuart we start with you where can people go to you know continue the discussion if they want if they had more questions for you is LinkedIn or Twitter or what's the best way to reach you? uh yeah LinkedIn uh is the best find, place to find me Stuart Rayner at LinkedIn all right thank you Stuart all right um Kevin yeah likewise I'm here on LinkedIn uh, happy to chat about data quality because I'm that kind of guy <laughs> awesome thank you kevin uh bring jordan back in for a minute hey, here. hey jordan i like well, how i, I, my I, I can't believe you you actually brought me back just kidding uh linkedin is the best way uh i also have my own site chief nerd officer.com where i write about on um, everything okay everything got it all right thank you jordan uh mr whisperer all right, Scott Taylor, the Data Whisperer. Find me on LinkedIn. You can find my YouTube channel. I got like 50, 60 videos out there. Make sure you watch the puppets of data. The <laughs> video here, the chief dog officer who's reminding all of you good decisions made on bad data are just bad decisions you don't know about yet. So perfect. Thanks. Give me anywhere. Kate, okay, thanks for having me, Alistair. Thanks for being patient. Keep me going here. See you all out there. All right. Thank you so much, Scott. Yeah. All right, let's see. We've got Susan. Susan, where can we find you? Oh, well, again, LinkedIn, Susan Walsh, or the Classification Guru. There's only one of me, so you'll find me quite easily. Um, or I'm also available on the classificationguru.com. And you can get links to all my other YouTube channels and things like that from there, too. Yes, absolutely. And I know we can't forget T. Scott and George Farrakin, who had to hop off for another call. But um, pretty sure they would say LinkedIn because that's. Yeah, really we're all on that on LinkedIn, and Kevin and I will happily geek out on data quality all day long. Yes, perfect. All right, thank you so much, Susan. Um, James, where uh, can people go to learn more? Pretty much the same as everyone else. LinkedIn's always a always a good just 
connect with me on there. Um, or failing that, we go to our, our company website, intelligent-ds.co.uk. Um, we're also going through a rebrand at the moment, so the the um, website will be updated and there'll be a lot more content to be shared through LinkedIn. So just just connect with me and you know we'll, we'll hopefully be able to share some interesting insights with you. Absolutely. And uh, I just want to mention there's also an iData Quality Academy LinkedIn company page where we're going to start sharing a lot yeah. more content on data quality, data governance. Um, so feel free to you know go ahead and follow that page as well. And then Al is there. Where can people go? People can find me either on LinkedIn or they can go to the iDataQualityAcademy.com website to enroll for the course, obviously, where you'll be updated prior to the course on yeah. August the 1st of what's going on. And yeah, by all means, follow us on Twitter, follow us on LinkedIn, and it'd be great to connect with you all. So I look forward to your invitation. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody who joined us live. Thank you so much for the guest speakers. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Kate. Thank you for who's joined in. Thank you. Thank you.